In the next instant, Daddy was there, a bowl in his hands. He tossed it on Mommy on the fluttering and flames bits. He picked up Hannah and threw her. Welcome to part two of my rant about the book Baby Teeth. Well, I look crusty. In these rants, I basically talk about everything that happens in a wacky book. And for part two, I'm gonna talk about the rest that I left out and the exciting conclusion. I'm gonna say my disclaimer again. If you are the author or a family or a friend or associate of the author, go ahead and click away from the video and don't even read the comments. You're not gonna have a good time if you do. None of this is meant for you. This is meant for my audience who is just looking for entertainment. This is not a personal attack against you. So please respect and distance yourselves from spaces that are meant for readers, not authors or publishers. Now for the rest of you who are tuning in, let me bring you up to speed and refresh your memory. In part one of my video, which I'll link down below, I talked about how this book centers on a stay at home mom who's struggling to connect with her child, who is very aggressive towards her and other people, except for her dad, who she acts like an angel in front of. The dad's only personality is being Swedish and being an idiot. Some of the things that the kid did in part one include acting like a French witch that possessed her when really she just looked up the French witch on Wikipedia and thought it'd be funny to mess around with the mom by talking in a French accent, but she's able to pull off the French accent and French words very fluently. She also makes an art project where she prints dead bodies of people that she found online because she was able to hack the dad's computer and then she puts a collage next to a naked photo of her mom, which the dad didn't blink twice when seeing this collage. She also sneaks into the mom's bedroom and chops off a huge chunk of her hair. She often listens to her parents having sex and this describing their genitalia when she peeks into the bedroom. I left off my last video with the mom waking up to the kid moaning and pretending like she's having sex with the devil. And this is something that she literally says in her French accent, that she's getting fucked by the devil. Obviously the mom is freaked out by this. She calls a psychiatrist who asks her if the kid has any history of being abused at home. The mom says, no, that's impossible because the kid is always at home and she's always with the kid at home. The only other person in the kid's life is the dad but the dad couldn't possibly abuse her because the dad is such a nice man and he's Swedish. Yes, she literally says he's Swedish as a reason for why he couldn't possibly harm his child. And that's where we left off. Many of you were horrified about this kid's behavior or how the parents dealt with the kid. Some of you said that this is why you don't want to have kids. And I agree with you. This entire book is a great argument for birth control. But honestly, we shouldn't even be having kids anyway because this planet is in danger. We have global warming, which is very much real, contrary to the naysayers. Our planet is burning up. The concessions made to the oil and gas industry are harming people from marginalized groups like black and indigenous people. And Congress needs to step the fuck up to do something about it. That's why I'm partnering with Climate Power to tell you to vote for the people who are enacting climate change in the elections during this year. We need climate champions in positions of leadership to keep fighting for environmental progress. And in order to do that, we need to show up this November. If our opponents of climate action get more votes and get those positions of power, they will literally block the climate change progress that we've made or worse, roll back on it. And then we go like 10 steps backwards. We already got the inflation reduction law to happen, which is huge, but we need to keep building momentum this November. So please commit to being a climate voter with me by going to Vote Future Org, where you can check your registration status and see the closest polling booth near you. Make sure to have a voting plan and help your friends make one too. A lot of states have early voting or vote by mail options to make it easier. And the site that I'm linking to is really easy to navigate. So you have no reason to not do this. I will have the site in my description below with a bunch of social media links to Climate Power if you wanna learn more about it and more ways to help. This is seriously so, so, so important. Please click on the links below and please vote this November. That way you're conscious will be a little bit easier as you watch me dive into the rest of this book. So with that in mind, let's pick up where we left off. Is this why he was Swedish? So that we can think, oh, he would never be capable of doing something so awful. Swedish people never do that. In fact, Swedish people, historically speaking, have never done anything wrong ever. However, the mom does remember a while back when the dad trimmed his facial hair into a goatee and he asked her if he looked cool and she replied that he looked like a Scandinavian devil. And the kid was there and she giggled and so then she wonders like oh my god what if he is 
abusing my child. So she makes an appointment with a psychiatrist on Monday to come see her in person. And also she plans on checking his search history to see if there's anything suspicious. She checked Alex's search history, see if there's more beyond Hannah's morbid interest. It would invite new questions about his secrets for creepy kinks and other taboo fetishes if he was visiting pornographic sites about witches or dead people. But that seemed unlikely. Throughout the relationship, Alex never hesitated to enumerate his reasons for hating pornography whenever the subject arose. By ruling out porn, she expected to free Alex of any suspicion. Okay, so he hates pornography. We don't really know why, but there are reasons to hate it because it does exploit women. So if he does hate it for that reason, how can he have like a woke reason but also say the R word earlier when talking about special needs kids and also be fucking stupid in general? It doesn't make sense. It's very inconsistent here. Who knew the Swedish could be so inconsistent? Then we get to the kid's perspective when the dad comes home and sees the mom's haircut. When daddy first saw mom mommy's new hair, his smile wobbled and mommy looked scared for a second, tugging on the layers like she could make them longer. You don't like it? Mommy asked. It's a surprise, but look at you, radiant. Mommy, who knew how ugly she was, breathed with relief. What inspired this? He asked. Your daughter, who cut off half my hair while I lay in bed sleeping. He turned to her, frowning. Hannah thought she might have blown it and felt squiggles of fear swimming inside her. Doing something like that, it can be dangerous for one. You shouldn't be using scissors like that. And it's a violation. Do you understand what that means? She shook her head, aware of mommy watching daddy with big, eager eyes. Well, at least there's no harm done. He winked at Hannah. Mommy looks more beautiful than ever. That's it. That's the response. When your kid sneaks in the middle of the night, wields scissors to slash your wife's hair, and all you have to say is, Damn, that's a nice haircut, kid. What a good job you made. Hannah had to hide her glee because daddy could never get really angry with her, and she was so excited for the day to end. She had already decided her next move. Sneaky and awesome. We also get some insight with what she's thinking about the other kids at her school. Just thinking about the other children ruined her good mood. If only they would all die and she could have school to herself. She's seen little blips on the news about mass shootings and had heard daddy rant about the gun problem. Not everyone needs a gun. Children do not need guns. But maybe daddy was mistaken. Maybe the other children weren't clever enough to conjure ways to handle their problems. Um, does this bitch support the NRA? <laughs> what the fuck is this? Why is this kid like, actually, maybe school shootings are necessary. But also, why would the author write this? If I had to guess, maybe the author is just trying to like, be as disturbing and shocking as possible. But then it's like, why? What is the point of this? I don't see any meaningful commentary that's arriving out of this. I just see something that honestly does not bode well considering the constant news that we get of school shootings and now we see this kid thinking about that or trying to justify it. Anyway, it's time to cancel the seven-year-old. I'm gonna tweet about this shit. So the kid's next plan to torturing the mom is tampering with her medication. Cause as I mentioned earlier, the mom has Crohn's disease. She needs to take pills in order to take care of it. She sneaks in the middle of the night to the bathroom with a flashlight. She puts a chair up to the counter so that she can stand and grab the medication and switch the powder. This is a very intricate plan that somehow a seven-year-old is able to pull off. Also, she's sneaking off in the middle of the night so often, obviously, they know that because she's done it so many times. Why hasn't anyone put like a bell or a baby monitor in her room? Her best choice would be the little plastic looking two-tone brown pills. Mommy took one with both breakfast and supper. She couldn't pronounce the name of it, but the label said, take one capsule by mouth every four to six hours as needed for diarrhea. This is where we see shit about to hit the fan, literally. The bottle was a bit tricky, but she imitated how mommy pressed her palm into the top of it, then turned. After a few tries, she got it to open. Yes, because medication that is baby proof and kid proof would somehow magically be able to be opened by a seven year old who can barely fucking move around. So she realizes that the powder looks like flour and then she, for the next two hours, uses a tiny knife to put flour inside the capsule. The process is obviously painstakingly slow. So she doesn't do it for all of them. She only does it to a few pills and then she puts those at the top of the bottle. What I'm wondering is how the fuck can a kid be that careful and put the capsules back on or have that much focus 
focus for two hours because I remember when I was like volunteering for this one place that had a bunch of kids around her age those kids were clumsy as hell they were fucking tripping everywhere making a mess you're telling me she didn't spill flour anywhere pills are very small things how is she able to do it so intricately and carefully at this point it would just be more believable if she was actually possessed by a witch who's an older adult because there's no way this kid is pulling off all of this shit later on when the dad and the mom and the kid go shopping this isn't really relevant to the story i just want to read out this paragraph as an example of the nuance of the story daddy wasn't looking so she stuck her tongue out mommy scratched the tip of her nose with her middle finger the bad finger that meant a bad word she couldn't quite tell mommy was just fixing an itch or giving her the bad word finger so as you can see there's this rivalry going on when the dad is being an idiot and not looking and then the mom flipped her off when she stuck her tongue out or did she flip her off was she simply just scratching her nose we don't know that's just one of the many examples why this book is so nuanced like that it's like wow is the issue really about this demon child or the mom flipping off her own kid so much gray morality it really makes you think so with the pills switched out with flour obviously the mom gets really sick she's shitting everywhere <laughs> it makes her really paranoid that her health is worsening as an update though about her snooping through the dad's computer she did didn't find any porn. What she did see was where the kid found the pictures of the dead woman. She wonders that the kid is like herself because she actually used to resent her mom too. And she wonders if maybe the kid had inherited whatever darkness was in her. Again, I think that's the message we're going for. Like, is it the mom's fault or is it the kid's fault? Blah, blah, blah. Great morality or at least some attempt at it. I guess. She talks to the dad later because she's going through some kind of like midlife crisis or some shit because she's like, do you miss it when we used to talk about everything? Sure, sometimes, but life progresses. Have we progressed? Sure, as a family. But we only talk about Hannah now. What about us, you and me? Have we progressed? It's different now. We have more responsibilities. I don't feel like I've progressed, she said. As a person, I've slid, laterally. I'm sliding down a gradual slope. This very stilted dialogue is here to show the character of this mom, where we get a hint that maybe she misses the old life that she used to have before the kid, and maybe that's why it contributed to the kid acting out, because the kid knows deep down the mom doesn't want her in the picture. However, I would argue that the mom is simply pointing out that she has no fucking character development whatsoever. She's not a real person. She's just an empty, doting wife who has rocks for a brain because she somehow has never pulled out a phone to record her kid being weird and used it as proof and also lets her Swedish husband get away with being a buffoon. Speaking of being Swedish, <laughs> Because again, we're gonna be Swedish throughout this whole book for some reason. The kid at the school is writing down different phrases in French and in Swedish. The teacher is impressed because she's like, oh wow, you know Swedish, French, and English? You're so smart. I'm not even in question how you even know how to write all this shit. Duolingo really has a chokehold on you. Then later, the mom picks her up from school and then she asks her how it's going. She's just blathering on and the kid is like, oh my God, bitch, shut the fuck up. I'm gonna say something really out of pocket now. The kid interrupts and she's like, one of them will have to die. She met her mother's startled gaze in the rearview mirror. Excuse me, what did you say, Hannah? Je suis Marianne. And then the mom decides to go along with it and she says, excuse moi, Mary Ann, I didn't hear what you said. Her French sounded exaggerated like the puppets on Sesame Street. If the mom speaks in an exaggerated French accent, that implies that the kid has a very natural French accent. Again, I have to ask, how is this possible? Hannah sighed impatiently. If you make me go there again, I will cast a spell on one of them. One of them will die. In the mirror, her mother chewed her lip, weighing how to respond. Which one? I mean, honestly, that's all you're gonna ask at this point. Yeah, yeah, which one? You know, your fucking weirdo Emily in Paris act is getting old, bitch. You either kill a kid or not. We're already past halfway point of this book. You gotta kill someone at this point. Shake things up a little bit, you know? I'll pick them off one by one, she said. It will be your fault. If you end up in jail, it won't be my fault. That's what happens to people who hurt other people. 
a jail can't hold me. Okay, if that's what you want. Personally, I think school is a better option than jail. The mom just goes along with it, and then the kid is like, oh, she's so stupid. Oh, I'm sorry, I mean, stupid. <laughs> they go to the therapist after school, and this is when the therapist catches the dad up with what's been going on. Suzette has informed me of a couple of incidents. The dog barking, which was quite alarming to Suzette because of how intense it was, and she had concerns for her own safety. But Hannah is exhibiting other disturbing behaviors as, what kinds of disturbing behavior, he asked annoyed, skeptical. Shut the fuck up. She was literally about to tell you and you interrupted her. Already he's having a pissy fit. There was an incident where she acted out sexually. Just because she's a child, he said to the therapist, doesn't mean she can't have sexual feelings. I agree, but the incident Suzette described, your daughter claimed in that moment that the devil was having intercourse with her. My opinion is that this alter ego is a way for her to break the ice of source. She's adopted a persona who is allowed to speak to be demonstrative in a way that Hannah still won't permit for herself. It doesn't mean she's a witch, but we do need to understand what this behavior means and what your daughter's trying to express. She's a very precocious girl who's built a wall around herself, and we don't know why she felt she needed the wall, but I think she's trying to find a way over it. And right now, this is manifesting in some new behaviors. So the the therapist is obviously talking some sense for once, probably the first time any character in this fucking book has made any sense, but the dad is pulling a pissy fit, they go to the parking lot and he's lecturing the mom about how she didn't tell him what was going on. You need to keep me fully apprised of what's going on. I felt so stupid not even knowing. Literally, what would you have done? You're so fucking stupid. Anytime she told you anything, you didn't even listen. So it's basically as good as not telling him anything. So then when they get home, they find out that one of the kids' toys is now ruined and it's this potato that she put under the bed. The potato is like this character that's part of a bed time story that the dad used to read to her like right before she would go to sleep because in the story there's something called like the under bumble slumber beast that just hides under the bed and so she wanted to have her own beast she took a potato she drew like eyes on it and put like weird stuff on it but the mom had found it at some point and when she saw that there was an eye patch over the potato she got scared because one of the teachers at the kid's school has an eye patch so she thought that it was like a voodoo doll especially because the kid drew red crayon going down the potato's eyes which she thought was blood but it turns out that the kid was just trying to draw tears so the mom basically half mashed the potato and ruined it now the dad is pissed off and the mom is apologizing profusely because she feels so bad about it and the dad is like what's wrong with you how could you do this blah 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 and I'm like okay why is it that the mom messes up once and it's this whole drama where everyone's like oh my god you awful mother how could you do this but every other time when the kid is being a fucking menace by printing dead pictures writing curse words pretending to be fucked by the devil all of that gets swept under the rug so quick we didn't even really get a reaction to the dad saying anything about why the kid was acting like she was fucked by the devil he just gets mad about it and then he lectures the mom that he wasn't told earlier. Okay, well now that you know, what do you think about it? Or are you just gonna be a fucking dense idiot like you always are? So later, the mom tries to make it up. She offers two bowls of mango sorbet to the dad. And she's like, how's she doing? His big shoulders went up and down. That was way not cool. I know, dot, dot, dot. If only she would show you her witch side, dot, dot, dot. Maybe you'd understand how I get so creeped out. We'll talk later. Of course. He wants to talk later. Anytime they have any kind of serious conversation, he's just like, oh, we can't talk about it now. Let's talk about it later, blah, blah, blah. Bitch, when are we actually gonna talk about it? No wonder she never told you about the kid acting like she's fucked by the devil until they went to the therapist's office. He literally never has an actual conversation with her about any of these things. We'll talk later. When the fuck is later then, huh? Put it on the Google Calendar, bitch. I wanna see you own up to that shit. I want you to write out every single word she said as Mary Ann. I already have. I wrote it down for Beatrix. I'll send it to you. And tell me every time it happens again. I need to know. I will. I promise. Okay. And maybe dot dot dot. Try to stop being afraid of her. She's trying to communicate with us. With you. Frankly, I'm kind of envious. And you're not even appreciating. Dude, shut the fuck up. Oh, she's not being appreciative that her kid is being a fucking menace and trying to kill her? Man, people really don't know how lucky they have it, I guess. 
And again, what's the point of her documenting everything? Are you even gonna react? Or are you gonna be like, we'll talk about it later. We'll circle back later to this. And of course, the kid is already planning what to do next. She starts writing down a list of ideas to hurt the mom, but because she doesn't want to be exposed, she decides to write it in secret code, which is Egyptian hieroglyphics. How does she know this? I don't fucking know. Apparently she is a multilingual queen. She knows every goddamn language ever invented <laughs> by humankind. It would be very nice to sew mommy's mouth shut, but there was a problem getting her to stay still enough through the procedure. She drew a one inch line that represented a needle and next to it, a pair of X's that symbolized mommy's eyes. Unconscious, asleep, and then three more think about it dots. I like how she writes three think about it dots because it's like she's brainstorming the same way that tech companies do you know when they gather together on the fucking whiteboard and they put together like these notes and annotations she's like hmm let's circle back and get to this later i gotta hop on a zoom call with boss baby and we'll brainstorm this out and she spends a whole page planning on hitting the mom in the head with a hammer or throwing a toaster in the bathtub while she's taking a bath to electrocute her or poison her food or other things and at this point i feel like the author herself is just thinking out loud what the kid can do next and we just have to go along for the ride the author was like hmm should i brainstorm my novel or should i write it i know i'll just do both later when the kid goes to school she uses the school computers to google how to start a fire and there's another kid there who's wearing a helmet and he's wearing a helmet because he's a special needs kid so he has this habit of like i think when he's like overstimulated he'll like knock his head against the wall and it could be really dangerous of course she takes off the helmet and she starts to bark at him and he's like kind of freaking out and he then keeps hitting his head on the wall until it bleeds and he needs stitches and the workers come in the parents get called in and they find out that now she's been expelled from the special needs school the dad is pissed off and he says they can't even prove that she did it even though she was literally the only other person in the room with the kid with the helmet the teachers are basically trying to explain that like they can't keep this kid in their school because she could be a danger to the other kids so they have to look out for the other children too but he's just so upset by this that he storms out and yes he literally storms out because he can't actually do any confrontation or admit the truth because he's a stupid man child in the parking lot the mom trying to explain you know she did it again like i told you this shit would happen blah 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 and he's like i don't want to talk about it okay bitch i thought we were gonna talk about it later now you don't want to talk about it what the fuck is going on now you see her manipulative behavior this is what she does again at school we finally found a good this was not a good school this was not the right school for her she cowered not expecting alice to direct his anger toward her this is what she's learned being in a school with other kids who can't behave properly she learned this here bitch don't even blame this on the other kids if anything, I blame this on you because you're such a dumbass that now your kid is all fucked up like this. How can you be in such denial and literally storm off and let the mom deal with everything? And he literally does leave because the mom tells him she wants to go with you. I think it's better. And he's like, take her home. I'm going to the gym. He slammed his car door and started the engine. So he fucking leaves the two of them because he has to cool off at the gym when he's barely spending time with the kid anyway. Anytime something bad or difficult happens that challenges him as a parent, he fucking bounces out of here. He literally can't handle any kind of conflict. The mom has to deal with everything. And it's so frustrating because it's like, what has he done this entire time? He has not looked up any resources to try to help out this kid. He's never done any research. He hasn't made any appointments. He doesn't look up what schools to bring the kid into. The mom has been doing all of this. He has no right to be this pissed off when he's barely pulled in his way. So then in the next chapter, we go back to the kid's perspective. We get more of her motivation. Hannah hoped she was strong enough to do what needed to be done. Helmetless head was a productive exercise beyond getting her kicked out of Pissdale. The school is actually called Tisdale, but she calls it Pissdale. Skulls were hard. A lot of force would be required to crack one open. It would expose her, but when daddy returned to his unspelled self, his eyes bright and full of love, he would understand why she had to do it. Why mommy had to die so he could be saved. In the end, he'd thank her. Her way of thinking doesn't really make sense. 
She wants to kill the mom so she could have the dad to herself. But I thought her motivation was to test the mom. Remember the flashback when she was three, when she was like a normal-ish annoying kid? And then she had that traumatic moment where the mom forced her to eat to the point of choking. I thought this whole thing was to try to test the mom to see if she really loved the kid. But now all of a sudden it's like, oh, I gotta say daddy, I want him to myself. Why does he even need to be saved? The motivations are very murky. They seem to like flip-flop around here. I don't know. I feel like a lot of this writing is just getting pulled out of our asses at this point. But her new plan is to smash the mom's head with a hammer. She left the hammer just outside of mommy's bedroom door, then snuck back to her own room to get what she needed for part one. It was a very funny plan, really. But part one might just make her go, ah, ooh, and flop around and whack her chin on the floor, maybe knocking out a tooth or biting through her lip. If Hannah was very, very lucky, mommy would knock herself unconscious bonking her head on the bedside shelf. And if that happened, part two would be so much easier. She just had to burst in and whack away with a hammer until her brain started to ooze out. The plan is a little bit more layered because what she does is she sneaks into the mom's bedroom while the mom is sleeping and she puts thumbtacks on the floor next to the bed. When mommy started moving, Hannah hunkered down, hiding. But she was just turning over. Mommy let out a little fart and Hannah almost lost it. Why'd she have to mention that the mom farted? <laughs> How is this relevant to the story? Later, the mom wakes up to the sound of a crash. She gets out of bed and steps on all the thumbtacks. So she's very injured and is in a lot of pain. This is when the kid opens the door, double fisting a hammer. But for some reason, when the kid looks down at all the thumbtacks and all the blood, her resolve seems to waver a little bit. So she kind of like hesitates and the mom uses that moment of hesitation to lurch onto her elbows. You fucking little monster. She would have thrown something, a knife, a grenade. Imagine just throwing a grenade at a kid. <laughs> it's like, you know what? I've had enough, you bitch. Boom, you fucking little. I'm calling the police. And it runs away and then the mom crawls over to her phone. Suzette felt defenseless, but instead of calling the police, she speed dialed Alex's number. Why? Why would you call your husband in an emergency when he literally hasn't done a single useful thing in this entire book. He would literally be the last person I would ever call if I ever face any danger or emergency. I would sooner call a fucking rock on the floor for that rock's help than even get anything from him. So on the phone, she gets the dad's workplace. She says it's an emergency and she needs to talk to him. They put her on hold. While on hold, she considered taking a photo of her injured feet. Proof should Alex need it, but she changed her mind. The damage would be enough evidence and she didn't need to memorialize the event. It wasn't as if she were going to share the deaths of her daughter's savagery on Instagram. I mean, I guess you don't really need proof at this point because the proof is right there from your bleeding feet. But can you imagine if she were like a mommy blocker and she's posting this shit on Instagram? Seven creative ways my daughter has killed me. The dad picks up the phone and she says, Come home. She heard me, Alice. Thumbtacks on the floor. I'm bleeding all over the place. I can't be alone with thumbtacks. <laughs> this fucking useless motherfucker. <laughs> In my feet. They were beside the bed. She came into my room with a hammer. I can't walk. I'll call 911. I could have done that myself. I need you. Bitch. Why? He hasn't done anything. Yes, you could have called 911. Why didn't you? So then the dad rushes home. She heard him thundering up the stairs, calling her name. It struck her that he still had his shoes on. Swedish state of emergency. She giggled. Huh? He was in such a rush to help you that he had his shoes on? How is that a Swedish state of emergency? You know, just because he does something doesn't mean it's Swedish. Bitch, you literally have thumbtacks on your foot. Why are you giggling about your husband being Swedish? Now that he's home, he tends to her wounds and then they call the psychiatrist and they explain what happened and he says, I don't know what to think. She's never done anything to me, but I didn't think she could do something like this. Again, we already know you have a dumb mentality. You think that just because someone doesn't do something to you doesn't mean they can't ever do something to someone else. But I guess that's finally enough for him to have a breakthrough because later when he's talking to the mom, he says, I used to criticize my father for being so unobservant. My mom and I used to joke about rearranging the furniture. We knew he'd crash into it before even noticing that any Anything had been moved. Oh, okay, so stupidity seems to run in the family. Like father, like son, I guess. But then the mom's like, you're not like that. You're very present with us. Present, but oblivious. 
half on, half aware, half always thinking about other things, projects, things that need to get done. I notice when my car isn't running well, but not my family. Bitch, you're not even present. The moment anything bad happens, you just storm off. That's not being present. You are too busy eating Swedish pastries instead of tending to your wife. Next chapter, we get the kid's perspective. We find out that she faltered a little bit because she was afraid of seeing so much blood, which does not make sense to me. How can you look at pictures of dead bodies, but then all of a sudden, a little bit of blood because of thumbtacks like you put down, that's like too much for you. That's like crossing the line there. So then the dad talks to the kid in her room to try to tell her that hurting mom wasn't okay and then he asks if this is because of Marie Ann and that's when he gets an idea where he's like what if we made her go away I have ranted on for too damn long in this video that my camera keeps dying okay final stretch let's get the shit over with the dad again is proposing to cast Marianne away. Sunday is Walbridge's and we'll have our own backyard fire. Sometimes when people want things to go away, they toss their worries into the fire. So maybe dot dot dot, you could draw a picture of Marie Anne and on Sunday evening, we'll cast her away. Hmm, yes, because being around fire will definitely help. Certainly nothing will go wrong from adding fire into the mix. I also like that for the first time he has some kind of solution to help with this problem. It's obviously related to his Swedish tradition. So because they plan on starting a fire, he goes to the store to pick up some stuff. The mom freaks out because she's like, what if she wakes up? Finds me here alone. At least dot dot dot, leave me here with a weapon or something. He suggests to put a bell at the kid's door. The bells will be fine, she said, reluctant to admit she'd feel safer with a hockey stick or a rolling pin or an electric cattle prod. Maybe after he left, she'd hobble to the closet and dig out his old tennis racket. I like how she's just thinking of like every possible weapon to defend herself with against this child so that she can fucking whack the kid like a baseball bat. Honestly, I don't blame her. I too would like to play softball with this kid. He explains the plan to the mom and she says, a fire in our backyard? With how she's been? You didn't want to believe it, but she likely did set that garbage can on fire when she was in. It's not just for her, it's a tradition, welcoming in the spring. Wall purchase? Witches night? You can't be serious. It's a bit of home, he said, his face so innocent and needy. So you're not even interested in helping out your kid, you just literally want to do the Swedish tradition. Because you literally have no other motivation in this book. You really think it's that easy? She carried out a sophisticated, well-planned attack. I know, I'm not forgetting what she did, but what are we supposed to do? Tiptoe around her and pretend like nothing happened? Bitch, that's exactly what you've been doing this entire book. Is that not your game plan from chapters one to infinity? So in order to burn Marianne and cast her away, the plan is for the kid to draw a picture of what Marianne looks like, and then they'll toss the picture into the fire pit. But the mom is thinking, maybe she should offer Hannah help in drawing Marianne. Maybe it could be their first real mother daughter art project. She could say through her actions, I am helping you excise your inner demons because I love you and I'm sorry for your terrible unreachable pain. Yeah, because that's a great way to bond with your kid. Help her draw the witch that's allegedly possessing her to kill you. Just mother-daughter bonding moments. And so when the mom helps the kid draw Marie Anne, she goes on and on about how to draw every single part of the stick figure. And we waste so much dialogue across these pages that it's almost like the author is trying to hit a word count. Let me show you what I mean. So I like to start by drawing two little lines, just slashes really. One here where the top of the head will be and one here for the feet. This way, you know your whole figure will always fit on the page and you won't run out of room. Then I make two more slashes, one near the middle where the waist will be and one up here for the shoulders. I like to proportion human figure off the sides of the head. So I draw an oval for the head, dot, 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 and then a neck, dot, dot, dot. And including the head, the whole body will be about seven to eight ovals of about the same size. So I draw three ovals beneath the neck and there's the torso. And you see the last oval straddles the line I drew for the waist. And then four ovals on either side of that. And these are the legs, smaller sideways ovals for the feet. Then I go back to the line I made for the shoulder. I draw a smaller circle on either side of the upper torso. Those are the shoulders. And you see how they line up with the hips and legs? Then beneath the first shoulder, I draw an oval, same size as the others. A little circle. That's the elbow. Another oval. Another little circle. That's the hand. Bitch, move on. This is me cramming for my final essay, trying to hit the word count requirement. This reads like the first draft of a novel when you're running out of steam and you don't know what else to write. Might as well copy and paste the whole Wikipedia page instructing you how to draw. This is a horror book, not a drawing manual. 
pack it the fuck up and move on. So then they prepare a bonfire, they're prepping up their eulogy, the dad sings a Swedish song because of course he fucking would, and the mom is thinking about how she smells because she hasn't taken a shower. Suzette sniffs her armpits. Her natural smell was barely masked by the powdery perfume of her deodorant. She hadn't showered in days and didn't really want to soften the comforting scabs that had formed on the soles of her feet. She couldn't remember when last she had gone so long without cleaning herself or some part of the house. The thought wasn't unappealing that vines could grow up through the floors, snake along the walls, fill the house like a jungle, and she in her racks could climb them and find a perch on the ceiling. In that savagely deconstructed domesticity, there'd be no need to speak. She'd reek up musk, and Alice would fuck her from behind. Maybe there'd even be a place for Hannah there, barking like a chimpanzee, a wild child, a happy pet. I mean, weird daydream, but all right. <laughs> Considering this bitch has been tortured throughout the entire book, maybe I can't really fault her for romanticizing not taking a shower while her freaky ass kid is just barking like a chimpanzee in the corner. Sometimes that's all you can dream about in your blissful domestic life or happiness. She fought the urge to spring up and help lay the kindling, help prepare the food, help bring out the plates. Alex's energy might be explained by his verb for the holiday. The Swedes liked their festivities, even ones who had been removed from their culture for nearly 20 years. Are Swedish people actually obsessed with their festivities? Or is your husband just a giant weirdo who has a boner for Sweden? So they get the fire going and then the dad starts singing with exuberance. I will go ahead and play the audio for you. <laughs> Suzette grinned. Alex had an imperfect voice, but he sang with exuberance. She clapped her hands to the beat of his music. She joined in for the last few lines, which, in their repetition, she learned over the years. Say the man, song in barn dum stunder, felia beckins dance till clarn at fear. His face lit up as she sang along. What the fuck kind of singing was that? <laughs> That's not even singing. The narrator was like, I ain't even gonna bother. I'm not getting paid enough for this shit. And of course his face would light up once she starts singing Swedish too. The man has no actual personality. You say a few Swedish words and he's like, oh my god, I'm so happy. So then he gives a eulogy in a deep priestly voice. They throw the drawing and set it on fire. Yay, it's done. Or is it? Since they're standing around the fire, the mom kind of has trouble balancing because her feet are kind of fucked up due to the thumbtacks from earlier. So she trips a little and she spills some wine on her clothes and the dad offers to get a cloth from inside the house which means she's suddenly alone with the kid right in front of this fire after they allegedly cast away this witch gee i wonder what could happen so she sits down and she sees the girl just staring at her really creepily and then the girl extends her arm forward and points at the mom with two fingers and she starts mouthing silent words over and over then she gets closer to the mom and she rolls her eyes back and the mom is like oh my god marie ann is not gone the fire had its taste of mommy yummy yummy music and wanted more the fire wanted to eat her had kept her spell focused directed at mommy through two outstretched fingers and mouthed the words suffer and cease to be suffer and cease to be the reason why I play this audiobook out loud is because I want you to imagine this narration the entire time in the audiobook. Yummy, yummy! <laughs> this is what we're dealing with here, okay? So the kid prods the flames with her stick, she finds a burning branch, and she flings it out of the pit, and it lands on the mom's lap, so the mom starts screaming. She falls out of her chair while trying to push the branch away. The kid then uses her stick like a shovel to scoop out the burning embers and throw them on the mom's leg, and her foot. The mom keeps on screaming. I mean, she's basically being tortured in any possible way throughout this book. The kid's just like, how can I fuck up my mom in every possible way? And then the kid realizes that the tip of her stick is glowing orange from the fire. So she tries to stab the mom's eye with it, but then the mom at the last minute just looks up and so her aim kind of is off and she ends up plunging the fiery stick right into the mom's cheek. So it sizzles and then the mom screams even more. Then the dad finally comes out of the house because I guess after all of that screaming, that last scream was the one that really hit it for him. In the next instant, daddy was there, a bowl in his hands. He tossed it on mommy on the fluttering inflamed bits. He picked up Hannah and threw her. Fucking finally, this man does something. He fucking upchucks the kid, throwing his goddamn child like a fucking basketball. Boom! Slam dunk, bitch! She landed splat on a muddy patch of grass and rolled, stunned. Something tore inside her wrist, the one that she'd held out to break her fall. Her thumb was going to come loose and fall off. She screamed. Another thing that he does right, he does not pay attention to the kid and just rushes to the mom and pours water on her. So the whole time, the kid is crying in the background because 
he's not paying attention to her anymore. And then the kid watches what's going on. So the mom lifts the compress off her cheek and showed it to daddy. Is it okay? Holy shit. Daddy couldn't stop zip zip spazzing. We need to get to the doctors. Is it that bad? Oh God, I'm not going anywhere without pants. Grab me some shorts. Daddy put mommy on the big table and wiped at her with wet dish towels while mommy held a wet cloth to her face and wept. Her head fell against the table and daddy yelled, should I call 911? The mommy shook her head but couldn't stop crying. The drama of it scared Hannah a little. Girl, you started the drama. You're the most dramatic bitch in this whole story. <laughs> what do you mean the drama of it scared you a little? Daddy charged up the stairs. That's when mommy finally noticed her. At first, mommy froze, big-eyed and ready to flee. Hannah inched over, mewling a bit, clutching her arm beneath the swollen part. Hannah? Are you hurt? What were you doing? Dot 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 question mark. Is it broken? Bitch, I don't give a shit about your wrist. <laughs> I wouldn't ask her, what are you doing? Oh, what's going on? Are you hurt? I'd be like, yeah, bitch. You're gonna be stuck with limp wrist for life. She gets no sympathy from me. If you try to stab me in the eye with a fire stick, I'm drop kicking you to the curb. So then the whole family drives to the urgent care for both the mom and the kid. And then dad says something stupid like, I can't believe she would do this. Shut the fuck up. Literally, shut the fuck up. I'm tired of this man playing dumb every time she does something psychotic. Oh my god, how did this happen? Shut up. So then at the doctor, we get the mom's point of view. She was struck by the doctor's youth and beauty, her magnificent thick hair and coppery skin. Suzette wanted to ask where she was from, unable to pinpoint her ethnicity by her name or coloring, but she knew such a question was impolite and would likely yield a truthful but unhelpful answer. Berkeley, California, Newark, New Jersey, Columbus, Ohio. Likely she had parents or grandparents from one or several other parts of the world, but Suzette accepted the irrelevance of her own curiosity. Uh, yeah, it is irrelevant. You just got burned, bitch. Why are you trying to figure out where your exotic doctor comes from? Also, what do you mean by truthful but unhelpful answer? Why is it unhelpful? You really want to know where her country of origin is? This woman is like the type of white lady who's like, where are you from? No, where are you really from? Don't give me a state from the US. I need an exotic country to pinpoint. I'm like, bitch, we don't have time to look up your doctor's 23andMe family history. Your face is fucking burnt. The doctor confirms that she has second degree burns. And then the mom thinks to herself, what would Alex think? He might say she was still beautiful. Girl, who fucking cares? Your doctor daughter just tried to kill you. I don't give a shit what the, your dumbass Swedish man thinks, whether you look pretty or not. So because she showed up to urgent care with these injuries along with her daughter, the doctor asks if there's any abuse going on at home. And then the mom ends up admitting that it was the daughter that did it. Your daughter dot 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 hurts you? I don't know why, she said, the pain a bit greater than even her throbbing cheek. I don't think I ever did anything that terrible, dot dot dot, not intentionally. We, my husband and I, know there's something wrong. We're trying. We have an appointment with her therapist first thing in the morning. The doctor nodded, stunned into silence. Suzette read the fear, the newness of such a dilemma in the doctor's face. Well, if there's anything we can do to help, dot, dot, dot. But it was an empty offer, and the doctor was already moving away from her, peeling off her blue nitro gloves. Her body language changed, closing herself off from the situation. It was all too weird, too foreign, too diabolical. That is so weirdly standoffish and maybe even unprofessional. Like the mom basically told the doctor that the kid tortures her. And the doctor's like, oh, a kid did it? None of my business. I only deal with domestic abuse from spouses. You put a kid into the mix, I'm not dealing with this chucky bitch. When they got home from urgent care, Hannah plodded off to her room. Neither of them thought to follow her up or make sure she brushed her teeth. Alex brought in Suzette's crutches and the remnants of their feast. The dishes stayed on the counter, spoiling. They collapsed together on the couch, huddled in each other's arms like refugees. That last line is so dramatic. They're like huddling with each other, so scarred and traumatized. Bitch, you can take this kid on. I'm telling you, just one swift kick, that kid is gonna eat shit on the curb. So they end up talking to the therapist who then talks to the kid. And I gotta play this audio clip here where the therapist talks to the kid because the whole thing is just, it just speaks to how weird the narration is. Are you too brave to get scared? Me, no, I'm not. I was hoping you could draw me some pictures. Like, can you draw me a picture of mommy? Sometimes people see different things. And I want to see how you see your mommy. Oh yes, so, so smart. Beatrix understood that mommy always wore a mask. Is that a witch's hat? She asked. Yup, yup, yup. Is mommy a witch? Bingo. Now she told me about Marianne. I thought Marianne was a witch. Nod. And she was helping you? Yes, but she tapped, tapped, tapped on mommy's hat with her black crayon. But mommy is a witch also? Hannah made her eyes go big and round, and she nodded slowly so Beatrix would understand the gravity of the situation. Is mommy a scary witch? Oh yes. It feels good for someone to understand. 
Doesn't it? So, so yet. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Like, it's not just me that thinks this narration is weird as hell. Or maybe the narrator was just trying to work with the source material here, where she's like, big naughty not. Imagine being the therapist who's trying to piece this shit together, and she's like, oh, so you want to kill mommy? And then the kid's like, oh, yes. Why did the narrator have to say it like that? Oh, yes. Like, girl, are you okay? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Like, damn, girl, try not to bust a nut in this room, okay? So the therapist understands from the kid that she's trying to hurt mommy so that daddy will always love her. Again, different motivation from what we set in the beginning because I thought, based on the flashback from when she was three, she was trying to test the mom, but now it seems like the motivation has warped into her trying to protect the dad from the mom. Whatever, this whole thing doesn't really make any sense, so I'm gonna try not to think too hard about the motivation. So the therapist tells the parents that she recommends a mental facility for sociopaths and psychopaths and with her recommendation the kid would be there for a year obviously the dad is like oh my god we can't and then the therapist explains the great concern is the calculated nature of her violence her clear intent and determination and her overall lack of remorse and then the dad interrupts and says she's not she regretted what she did shut up shut the fuck up literally every time you speak shut the fuck up where on earth did the kid express remorse? Like, did you just pulled that out of your ass. You made that up. At no point when the kid was torturing the mom was she like, oh man, I kind of feel bad about that. <laughs> I kind of feel bad about fucking mommy up a little bit. <laughs> but then he finally comes around and he is starting to accept the reality. Finally, when we're near the fucking end of this book, I should have never doubted you. Maybe it's my fault that staying home isn't an option for her anymore. If I had listened to you sooner, dot, 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 I just couldn't believe, dot, 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 anyone when they said, how bad she was at school, everyone. And sometimes I could never say this. I can't say this. I miss you so much and I felt guilty. Guilty because you were right. Being parents changed us, the two of us. And it killed me to think how it had been between us before Hannah. You, all to myself. Then I felt like I owed her more because what sort of father has moments of regret? Dot, dot, dot. You know what I'm hearing? A bunch of excuses. And not even a well-written one. But the mom, she eats that shit up. Oh, Alex. She pressed her forehead against his, gripping his hair like she could pull him from an abyss. Yeah, 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 whatever. Point is, he finally apologized, took literally the one time of accountability by apologizing to her, and then he agrees that like she needs to be protected from this kid, even in means sending the kid away. So the end of the book is basically the two of them preparing for the kid to leave soon. The therapist says, I'm going to ask you a difficult question. Since you're focusing right now on the things you think you did wrong, I'm curious if there's one particular thing that stands out. And the mom thinks about it and she says, when we found out we were having a girl, I wanted to give her a Swedish name. <laughs> Because of course, of course she fucking would. An unusual name. Matt, Alex's partner, had twins not that long ago. A daughter named Stryker and a son named Sound. What kind of white nonsense is this? Stryker, Sound, time for dinner. I guess the names I liked were a little odd. Saga, Blix, Makin, Solvik. Sometimes I wonder if we'd named her something else, would she be someone else? Girl, I don't think the names would have made her any better. If anything, naming her those things probably would have made her worse. <laughs> like her name is Hannah and you are not dead. If you had named her fucking Blix, your ass would have been murdered for sure. She was born with dark hair, my hair. I needed to look at her and see Alex. I want a baby Alex, but she looked like me, like my mother. I let him pick her name too. I let him pick her name so I'd always remember she was Alex's child, Alex. Alex who I love. It was Alex I wanted all along. If I had to guess the point of this book is that the mom and the kid are both dealing with some warfare over the husband and want the guy all to themselves. Which is weird because he's clearly the dumbest person alive. If your motivations are gonna be over a man, why does it have to be that man? <laughs> it's really slim pickings over here. After they drop off the kid to the facility, they finally enjoy life together. We see a scene where the mom makes cinnamon buns because guess what? Those treats are Swedish. Because of course they fucking would be. She notices these empty pill capsules that are left behind in the flower bed. And so that's when they realize that the kid had tampered with her medication. And then we see the kid's perspective where she's in the facility and then she hates it. Of course, she even admits to missing her mom or at least the things that the mom did for her. She wants to be back with her mom and dad and then she is able to persuade one of the workers to let her make a phone call. We cut to the parents 
having sex in a very unnecessary scene. Alex slid her to the end of their magnificent tree slab table and she supported herself on her elbows. I can hear my neighbors going into the hallway. Y'all, the things I do for a YouTube check. <laughs> I'm so sorry for what I'm about to read out loud, but listen, I had to do this because if I read this shit, you need to hear it too. She threw her head back, intoxicated as usual by the feel of his cock making its entrance. Her favorite, favorite thing. He thrust in the gas and her body tingled with the sureness of her passion, his love, their connection. She never fucked another man and never wanted to. Afterward, they sat naked at the table and shared a carton of brownie fudge ice cream. We get this unnecessary sex scene. And I do believe it's unnecessary because in the next paragraph, it starts with them eating ice cream. Why couldn't the chapter just have started from there with them eating ice cream or just like lounging around enjoying their new home? Why did it have to start with this shit? Now I gotta risk my own embarrassment reading this shit out loud <laughs> to my neighbor. So while they're lounging around, the mom says that she started an art project and explains that it's gonna combine sketches and photography and it's gonna be like a pop-up book. She's just basically getting back into art and her passions again. And then the husband replies, it sounds really awesomely cool. Again, why have we spent the entire book fighting for the attention of a man who did describe something as awesomely cool. Is it worth it, ladies and freak children? Is it worth it? He also admits that he misses the kid less now and asks if that makes him a bad person. And then the mom replies that they needed to send her away so that they can move on and not look in the past anymore and just be a great couple together again. But then that's when they get a phone call because the kid you know, was able to get permission from one of the workers. He picks up the phone. She finally talks to them for the first time using the English language and she begs them to take her back and she talks about how much she misses them and that she'll be a good girl again. She even says stuff in Swedish. So you know that shit has daddy in the palm of her hand. Basically, she just really tries to play up this whole role of an innocent girl, but it doesn't work because even though the dad is really torn up about it, the mom is like, I ain't gonna have this bitch in my house again. So she tells the dad that the kid is just manipulating them again and it's better for her to stay in the facility so he's able to tear himself away. They really do leave the kid in the facility. We'll be okay, she said. She belongs there. His tears fell onto her breast. I know. She straddled him, knowing in a few minutes he'd be inside her again. They both feel so much better. Yes, in the end, horniness wins over taking care of your freak demon child. I'm sure this whole story is supposed to be morally gray. However, I don't find it satisfying that her happy ending is just having sex with this dumbass Swedish man but I mean my real happy ending would have been just never starting this book in the first place so the book finally ends with the kids perspective where she makes a plan to play along with the whole innocent act so that she can come back and win the long game this whole war that she made up in her head with the mom these are the last lines of the entire book she had conjured so many ways to be a bad girl but maybe that strategy had made her too visible mommy caught on to all her tricks so did all the teachers Hannah needed a sneakier approach for school and home. It might take some time. She couldn't unleash her new plan all at once or it wouldn't seem convincing, but she knew what she needed to do and who she needed to become. The best girl ever. The end. So I guess my final impression of the book is, what was the point of it? <laughs> I literally don't know any point. If I had to guess, I would think that maybe the book was trying to just include as many twisted, horrible, gross things as possible, really get into the warped psychological minds of people. But I don't really see the point of it if it's just a bunch of weird shit for the sake of having weird shit. Also, it got pretty repetitive after a while. Like the kid basically just tortures the mom over and over. Then the mom tells the husband, the husband doesn't do anything. And then the kid moves on to the next plan. So it doesn't really add anything new. We just go through this weird cycle of how much can we torture the mom? Because evidently the two dumbest parents in the world have raised a demon child. And she wasn't even like possessed or anything. At least that's my theory. I don't think she was actually possessed because we got to read from her perspective. It seems to me that 
there was some kind of tug of war going on between the mom and the kid where they both wanted the dad to themselves and maybe you're supposed to question who you should feel sympathy for and whose fault was it really like the kid is awful but was she awful because the mom actually has selfish intentions regardless of what the actual message was i don't give a fuck because <laughs> this book just was not written well i don't even say that because of the horrible gruesome things that happen because my stomach can pretty much handle a lot of twisted shit but there has to be like a point to it you know there has to be some kind of meaningful message where it really makes me think but the only thing that this book makes me think is how can i capitalize this on my youtube channel and so that's where we are but if this is entertaining for you i do have other books that i've read that were bad I don't know if you can hear screaming from my neighbors in the hallway. If you do, I mean, clearly it's not the weirdest thing that's being yelled in this apartment. I take the prize for that. I do have some other bad novels that I've read before that I've been meaning to make a roast video. So let me rest my mouth and my throat and also give you some time to digest everything that happened. So yeah, go ahead and unsubscribe. I'll see you later. Bye.